Hello, everyone. I'm, I'm watching people sign in on my phone, so I'm going to give them a few more minutes <laughs> as they come rolling in. I think I'm good. I think uh, I think I've got it. Honestly, especially if you would just tell me or come back and start there and come back and tell right either way. Okay. Okay, I'll come get you if I'm in trouble. Thanks, Simon. Hello, everyone. I think we should go ahead and start. I've watched numerous people come in on Zoom. Um, the way we have today set up, you can't see clearly who the participants are. <laughs> but when we get to discussion, you'll be able to see who else is online. So, so why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, I'm very pleased to be able to be have to, for us to be able to have the Eugene Litwick Litwack Honorary Lecture today. Um, we're doing it in an unusual way, <laughs> but let's just start first by talking about how uh, proud we are at, at SMS to sponsor this annual public lecture named in the honor of our, our former department head and professor emeritus of sociology and sociomedical sciences, Eugene Litwack. So I, I thought that um, we found these fantastic photos for his memorial. And I, I thought um, these, I believe, are photographs from previous lectures. Uh, those of you who are in the audience that are <laughs> in the pictures, I think that's where they came from. So um, Professor Litwack made major contributions to shaping the department's mission of seeking to bring together the social and medical sciences with the goal of addressing key public health and medical sciences, sorry, key public health questions through this interdisciplinary perspective. An innovative social theorist and public health leader, he advanced the field of sociomedical sciences, helping to position Columbia Mailman and us at, at its forefront of the field. Uh, you may know that Professor Litwack received his PhD in sociology from Columbia. Um, I forgot to note the year, but I do know he returned to Columbia in 1956, so that, that may help you get some context. Uh, and he, it, he returned to sociology at, at Columbia and later joined the faculty of the School of Public Health. As the head of our then division, actually, from 1985 to 96, Dr. Litwack broadened its focus on social science research and doctoral training to embrace health promotion and disease prevention with an emphasis on training MPH students. Maybe that's how we got you here, Marita, <laughs> part of that. Um, <laughs> as many or most of you know, Eugene died earlier this year, one of the reasons that we have these nice photos that were in the memoriam article. It is with sadness, respect, and admiration that we recognize Eugene and his family. His family may join. I Let me just take a quick look. Um, they were going to try to join. I don't see them yet potentially by Zoom. So um, whether they are here or not, they're certainly thinking of us and, now, and know that the lecture is going on today. Um, so his wife, Eleanor, may join as well as uh, his children, Nora uh, and Nathaniel. If, they, if they're here, of course, we welcome them and we wish that they were in person as I wish we all were in person. Um, I, I must say that um, listening to stories about him and, uh, and looking at the photos, I can tell how really beloved he was in SMS. So I'll just, I'll, I'll just conclude my comments on, on Professor Litwack by saying 
Um, Yasmin, the keeper of all records, found the, um, what was said by Richard Parker in the very first uh, lecture for, for Eugene Litwack. And I thought I would just repeat those words. They were certainly a, a good way to describe um, uh, Eugene. That he was committed to principles of academic excellence and social justice with deeply rooted social and political commitments and a remarkable capacity for empathy and solidarity. So I felt um, it would be just worthy of noting that in, in his passing of this year. So Professor Litwack's commitments, we hope are reflected in who we are in SMS at this point, certainly in the decades before this honorary lecture was established and hopefully for decades yet to come. Um, we our invited speaker for the lecture today, I also believe represents this commitment and the areas of focus that, that Eugene was committed to. So we're very pleased to um, have Dr. Jack DeVidio with us today. Let me bring him into view here. Um, speaker, oops, okay. Okay, that's, that's David Rosner. One second. <laughs> Where'd you go, Jack? Why That's okay. I, I got to figure out why you're not coming up as a speaker. What should I do? Okay, how's that? Okay, now we have uh, Dr. Jack DeVidio <laughs> as our presenter, not Dr. David Rosner, <laughs> but we're pleased that he's joining us. Um, I want to say that this lecture, as you may know, has been postponed two times, first due to COVID. I think, Jack, we invited you over two years ago, two and a half, three years ago, something like that. So first was a, a postponement due to COVID. And then last year, um, with the endorsement actually of Eugene and Eleanor, so that was one pleasure I had to be able to speak with both of them to decide whether to postpone for the doctoral student strike. And it was an adamant, yes, we should postpone in support of the strike by Eugene and Eleanor. And so we're very pleased, uh, Jack, to have you today, um, uh, even though by Zoom and that we're still doing hybrid, we're, we're very happy that you're finally able to be with us, um, even if virtually, Jack. So let me just say a few things about you. Um, it, his name is formerly John DeVidio. We all call you, I've always known you as Jack. <laughs> Received his PhD from the University of Delaware in 1977. He is the Carl Ivor Hovland Professor of Psychology and Public Health Emeritus at Yale University. He's also the co-founder of Diversity Science, an evidence-based diversity, equity, and inclusion consulting company where he is currently a senior, senior scientist. Prior to Yale, he taught at the University of Connecticut and Colgate University. Dr. DeVidio has also served in several administrative positions, including the Dean of Academic Affairs in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at Yale and as provost at Colgate. His research interests, which will be clear in the presentation today, are in stereotyping, prejudice, and discrimination, unconscious bias, social power and nonverbal communication, altruism and helping, and health and racial and ethnic disparities. Many of us also know his work well in stigma and health. Much of his scholarship in collaboration with Dr. Samuel Gartner has focused on aversive racism, a subtle form of contemporary racism since I believe the late 1970s, Jack, if I looked at your uh -huh. CV correctly. So you've been focusing on this for five decades, essentially. Um, he's published over 500 articles, chapters, and books, along with an, with an astounding range of collaborators, which is something that I always had heard about Jack before I knew more about him, the number of people he worked with and mentored. And so it's very impressive effort over all those, all those years so far. He's received several awards for lifetime scholarly achievement, including the Distinguished Scientist Award from the Society of Experimental Social Psychology, the Kurt Lewin Award from the Society for the Psychological Study of Social Issues, and the Donald Campbell Award from the Society for Personality and Social Psychology. I could go on and on about his various awards for teaching, mentoring, and professional service, and his service as editors of key journals in this area. But I think I'll just let Jack go proceed with his work um, and tell us um, all about um, the work that he's doing uh, currently, as well as how it's been created over time. Um, so welcome, Jack. We're very pleased to have you. <laughs> let me get your, um, if you want to go to share screen. Yeah, I'll do that. And we'll get started. We'll get your title up and we'll give it a try. There you go. Um, and hang on. 
Do you have the presentation in front of you? Yes, looks good oh, okay. from here. Looks good to the room. Okay, very good. All right. So obviously, Jack, the Dr. Davidio's talk is called "Racism Among, Among the Well-Intentioned: <clears throat> Implications for Racial Disparities in Healthcare." So welcome, Jack. Pleased to have you. Finally. <laughs> well, Kathy, thank you for the wonderful uh, introduction and the informative introduction about Dr. Litwack and for all your patience to get me here even, even virtually. So I'm, I'm really pleased to be here. Um, I regret that I, I have never met Dr. Litwack and won't have that, that opportunity. Um, I've, I've followed his work for many, many years and in some ways, his journey from sociology to public health and my journey from psychology to public health have some parallels. And uh, today I'm gonna talk to you about part of that journey. So I'll be presenting a bunch of evidence. I'm gonna to try to bridge uh, basic social psychology with public health, um, particularly with respect to uh, medicine. Um, and I'm going to be focusing on uh, particularly Black-White disparities in health care. But first of all, I want to talk about Black-White disparities in health. You know, I'm happy to talk about other groups, but um, the, uh, the, the issue of Black-White disparities in health is probably the most pressing, uh, one of the most pressing public health issues in America today, uh, more so than disparities between any other groups. Um, if you look at the data, the infant mortality for Black Americans has, is two times higher than for white Americans. And by the way, that proportion um, has been in effect for probably over 30 or 35 years, and probably, I could argue, up to uh, 200 years. Uh, Pregnancy-related deaths are three times higher for Black Americans than white Americans. Cancer rates, heart rate, COVID is significantly higher. And life expectancy of Black Americans, even today, is 3.5 years less for Black than for white Americans. Now, health disparities have multiple causes. Uh, they're related to socioeconomic status. They're related to uh, residential segregation. But what I wanna focus in on is not simply disparities in health, but I wanna have a more narrow focus around racial disparities in healthcare. That is what happens to black Americans relative to white Americans when they enter the healthcare system. Um, much of this work for me was inspired by an experience I had on the um, Institute of Medicine National Academy of Science panel that produced the unequal treatment volume in 2003. And what we focused on was particularly what happens in terms of healthcare delivery. And when we talk about disparities in healthcare, these are differences that cannot be accounted for by established medically related factors. They're unjustified differences in medical treatment, lower quality care, and it's differences in the uh, quality of the medical encounter. And I'm gonna focus a lot on the quality of the medical encounter because it has many downstream uh, impacts on health, adherence, and other factors, willingness to come back to the same uh, provider. Uh, so it's particularly important, even though it's, it's a different kind of disparity. And I wanna point out that this is a real disparity. It's a consequential disparity. Uh, by some estimates, 42% uh, of the studies in the literature reveal lower quality of care for black patients than for white patients. <clears throat> As I go through this, I'm going to give you the outline of, of the journey we're going to take. I'm going to talk about uh, basic social psychology of prejudice and some um, basic concepts in the psychology, social psychology of prejudice. I'm going to try to jump very quickly then to healthcare implications in terms of medical treatment and interactions. And then I'm going to talk about solutions that are personal, structural, and transactional. I'm gonna list a bunch of them uh, just to whet your appetite, but I'm gonna focus on two or three um, and drill down on those to, to give you some ideas of what works and what doesn't work. Now, when I started studying prejudice a number of years ago, the, the question people kept asking was, why are those people prejudiced? And when I began to investigate uh, the answer to that question, I began to come across a lot of social psychological theories 
that suggests that um, we may all have the tendency to become biased. And so what's much more interesting to me is why someone may not be prejudiced or say they're not prejudiced, despite these very basic processes that we engage in. And I'm gonna just give you uh, three categories, cognitive, which deals with the way people think, motivational, which deals with the fact that we have basic needs and try to satisfy those needs, and sociocultural, which is uh, the way we absorb the values of our society, even though we don't question those uh, values, even though we're not aware that those values are shaping our behavior and what we do. So cognitive, just as a flavor for that, one of the things we know is that the mere categorization of people into groups, which is the way people think to simplify the world, but the mere categorization of people into groups leads us to think about others in terms of those in our own group, the in-group, and those in other groups, the out-group. And what we find is universally, when people think of other people, other individuals as members of their group, we value them more, we um, uh, trust them more, we help them more than members of other groups. Members, when we categorize members of other groups under certain conditions, we will actually disparage and compete with them. So this becomes a very basic, social categorization is a very uh, basic foundation to prejudice. I also wanna point out is that in the United States, we automatically universally categorize people based on at least three categories. And those are race, uh, gender, and age. And those three forms of categories uh, actually produce three very virulent forms of isms uh, in our society, racism, sexism, and ageism. Motivation, once we categorize people into groups, we have desires for status and control, not simply for ourselves as individuals, but for members of our group. We're social animals, and if our group uh, uh, thrives, we thrive as well. And some psychologists like uh, Jim Sedanius would argue that this is innate, it's evolutionary based where we value our own group. But uh, one of the findings that he has is almost every society is characterized by a dominance hierarchy between groups. And the third is sociocultural, cultural stereotypes. We were founded on the proposition that all, and I'm gonna use air quotes for this, that all men were created uh, equal but it took us 200 years to pass legislation guaranteeing that black Americans were equal to white Americans. And in practice, we still have not achieved that equality. So um, because of these three processes, what we argue is many people, most people, most white Americans, because of these um, basic fundamental processes develop biases towards black people. And what we wanna argue then is that these uh, biases, these foundational biases affect the behavior of almost every one of us. So what becomes particularly interesting to me when I look at the, the situation this way is not somebody who says they're prejudiced because I can understand why. What my research is focused on is the people who say they're not prejudiced because what they're saying is that they can overcome all of these basic processes and rely solely on principles of fairness and justice and equality. And that led us to think about what is the nature of contemporary racism and the complexity of it, where it may suggest at a conscious level, uh, people will say that they're not prejudiced, but at an unconscious level, because of these processes, there still may be bias leakage. This maps on to an important distinction that has changed the psychology of prejudice immensely over the past years. And that is the distinction between explicit attitudes, which are very conscious, deliberate, um, and reflect our social and personal values. And it's what people self-report when you ask them what their attitudes are. And implicit attitudes, <clears throat> implicit attitudes are often unconscious, although not necessarily so. They're spontaneously activated. They develop from habits of mind. And these habits of mind are no, not only in terms of our personal experiences, but with what our culture tells us about who is valued and who is not valued. And uh, probably the most common measure of implicit bias these days, many of you may be aware of this, is the implicit association test, the IAT. 
Um, you can take it online. Millions of people have taken it. Now, what we find uh, is that most white Americans, about 70% of white Americans consciously express the point of view that they do not have biases, that they are not prejudiced, that they are truly egalitarian. But um, at the same time, about 65% of white Americans show an implicit racial bias towards black Americans. And that's gonna be my focus today is on the focus of the attitudes of white Americans towards black Americans at both an explicit level and an implicit level. And what we've hypothesized is this, that um, explicit attitudes and implicit attitudes are valid reflections of who we are as human beings. And they will both get expressed, but they'll get expressed in different ways. Uh, we tend to conform to our explicit attitudes in situations where we're very conscious and deliberative, in situations where right and wrong is clearly well-defined. We act in, according to our values and our attitudes and our belief, which are largely uh, non-prejudiced. But implicit attitudes gets expressed in situations where right and wrong is not clearly defined or appropriate behavior is uh, not clearly defined. They give us, they nudge us in a direction that leads to discrimination, but discrimination that occurs in a subtle, indirect way that we may not even recognize that we are discriminating. And I'm gonna give you just an example of that um, from a study we did a number of years ago. In the study, we had white participants. We asked them to help us make personnel decisions. Um, and we presented them with a candidate for a job who either had impeccably strong qualifications or who had moderate qualifications. Qualifications good enough to be hired but uh, blemished in some way and strengths in other ways. So it was a mixture of good and bad qualifications, but arguably good enough for the job. And what we did was we asked them to give us recommendations on how much we should uh, hire uh, the applicant. And what we found was this, when the applicant had impeccably strong qualifications, what you'll see is that the applicant got very strong um, recommendations to be hired. And the black applicant, as much as the white applicant, received these very strong recommendations, including, in, in fact, a, a little bit more strong for the black than the white applicant, perhaps as a way of reaffirming your um, conscious uh, image of yourself as being non-prejudiced. However, when you gave people information that was more ambiguous, when there was some good and there was some bad, I'm just going to look at the chat for a minute. Oh, hang on here. Uh, when we finish this, I'll go back to the chat. Okay, I'll try to return to the questions um, at the end. It will probably be the best way. Um, um, but when, when the applicant had moderate qualifications, what I want you to see here is a couple of things. First thing I want you to see is that the black applicant received lower recommendations than the white applicant. So bias does occur. Um, anything short of having impeccable qualifications leads to bias against the black applicant. But it occurs in a couple of ways because the white applicant who has mixed credentials is getting um, evaluated almost as strongly as the white applicant with impeccable qualifications, but the black applicant doesn't get uh, that um, benefit of the doubt. What also happens in this process is that what people are doing with the applicant with moderate qualifications is they're attending differentially to aspects of those qualifications. When the applicant was white, they were weighting those qualifications that the white person was strong in as most important for the job. And they were weighting what the black applicant was weakest in as being most important for the job. So at the end of the study, what we found is people would say that they didn't discriminate against the black applicant and they could come up with a justification. But what they were doing was they were weighting the information differently for the black or white applicant which led them to different ultimate outcomes. In the end, the outcome is the same as old fashioned blatant racism in that the black applicant doesn't get the job and the white applicant does on average. Uh, 
but it happens in a subtle way that, that the participants don't recognize. This bias, by the way, tends to be stronger among um, white Americans who are more implicitly biased. Um, the, another application of this kind of research was that we found, for example, in interactions between a black and a white person, uh, if you looked at the content of what a white person said, it was more in line with their explicit attitudes. White participants who said they were not prejudiced behaved in a very positive way in terms of the verbal content in their interactions with Black Americans. But when you looked at um, the white Americans' implicit attitudes, what those predicted was the nonverbal behavior. And so the nonverbal behavior in terms of how much you look at somebody, how responsive you are, where you sit, what your um, gestures are, and what your posture is tended to be predicted by a person's implicit attitudes. And white Americans' implicit attitudes leads to more negative nonverbal behavior, even though um, it often doesn't relate to the content of what they say. So there's a duplicity in terms of the way white Americans express themselves to black Americans as a function of the explicit and implicit attitudes and how discordant those are. Let's see. Sorry about this. My thing is frozen for a minute. Okay. Um, what I'm going to now talk about this is from the basic social psychology to work on health disparities and particularly healthcare disparities. And I'm going to talk about physicians' attitudes, physicians' decisions, and physician patient interactions. And this was, is a, an interesting topic because most physicians believe they're not prejudiced. And a large portion believe not only that they give equal care to Black Americans than white Americans, but a substantial portion report that they give better care to Black patients than white patients. Uh, when the uh, Institute of Medicine report came out, there was a lot of uh, backlash in the medical community. One of them uh, comes from Eps Epstein, who was a lawyer, actually, who says it's doubtful that hidden forms of discrimination are prevalent in a profession whose professional norms are set so strongly against it. But you gotta understand the dichotomy between our explicit attitudes, which may, and our intentions, which may be the best and most positive and egalitarian from the cognitive monster of our implicit attitudes. So what do the explicit and implicit attitudes of uh, doctors look like? Well, if you look at the, um, uh, explicit attitudes of doctors, they have bias, but it's actually a very uh, low level of bias in terms of white doctors being biased against uh, Black Americans. But if you look at doctors' implicit bias, you'll see that it's much stronger. And in fact, the level of doctors' implicit bias is comparable to the average American's implicit bias uh, against Black Americans. Um, Part of the reason is that implicit bias is laid down relatively early in life uh, through the experiences, through the media, through the socialization that we have. And once it catches hold because it's culturally influenced, it affects everybody in a pretty similar way um, if you're white. Uh, I can talk about black Americans implicit attitudes and explicit attitudes during question and answers. But what I want you to see is that uh, it is possible for well-meaning people, well-meaning doctors to be highly implicitly biased. You might think, well, the world is changing, so let's look at medical students. Uh, medical students indeed are um, uh, currently less explicitly biased than those who are already in the profession, but their implicit bias is just as high, uh, in fact, higher. And if you look at other providers, types of providers, such as nurses, you can see the same level of, of high implicit bias. So what I wanna argue here is that even though physicians are in a helping profession, even though they're well educated, even though they're doing their best um, and have committed their life to helping uh, their patients, they are susceptible to implicit biases. Now, one of the things when I did a literature search um, is I looked at how explicit and implicit bias um, affects uh, different types of treatments. And what I will say is in most cases, explicit and implicit bias has a limited effect 
on the ways doctors treat black patients. And part of the reasons is that medical care is strongly evidence-based and what's right and wrong is clearly defined. Probably one of the major exception areas has to do with pain treatment, pain medication. And there are a variety of reasons why that occurs. It's like the perfect storm. One of the reasons is that um, we don't have good objective measures of how much pain somebody is in. What we do is we ask them how much pain they're in on scales from one to 10. And then we use that as an index of how much pain um, somebody is experiencing. But we see that as subjective rather than objective. And it creates ambiguity and latitude for interpreting in many different ways. That makes people susceptible to the effects of implicit bias, as I explained earlier. Second of all, it's the infusion of stereotypes that can, can affect this process. And part of that has to do with uh, stereotypes about drugs, because part of train, uh, pain medication is the prescription of opioids. And if you associate blacks with drugs, illegal drugs and misuse of drugs, then it's going to make you more reticent to prescribe drugs to a black patient than a white patient. And the third thing is um, about a third of doctors still have some belief that came back from the days of slavery. I could trace it back to the days of slavery that black people experience less pain than white patients. And if you, um, endorse that stereotype explicitly, or you activate it implicitly, it's going to lead to um, less prescriptions of pain medication to a black patient than a white patient. Um, this finding, I'm gonna take the finding of Priscilla at all, I wasn't involved in the study, but what I liked about this study was these were actual patients that uh, were trained and sent to doctors, and these were the actual result of doctors' recommendations and prescriptions. Doctors who were higher in implicit bias uh, became less likely, were less likely to prescribe um, pain medication, opioid pain medication uh, to a black patient. And doctors who were higher in implicit racial bias were also more likely to prescribe pain medication to a white patient. So what you can see is high implicit bias was showing an in-group favoritism in terms of responsiveness to the white patient, but they were also showing um, a negative response to the black patient. But the ultimate result of this study is on average, black patients receive uh, less pain medication than white patients, and therefore they suffer a greater amount of pain. Um, in terms of the content uh, of, of the interactions that occur, what we've done, and Lisa Cooper has some uh, work on this that converges with some of the uh, studies that we've done, is that if you look at the nature of the interaction between white physicians or non-Black physicians and Black patients, we looked at both, um, and you look at the quality of the interaction where we videotaped and we've audio taped the interactions, and we looked at how uh, the level of a doctor's implicit attitudes predict their behavior in these interactions. What we find is white doctors who are more implicitly biased tend to have shorter visits with black patients. They speak faster. Um, they are less patient-centered in the way they treat the black patient and they're less supportive and responsive to the black patient in the interaction. In our work, we find that explicit attitudes don't predict this, but implicit attitudes uniquely predict these kinds of uh, responses. Remember, um, uh, white physicians tend to be uh, not prejudiced explicitly, but they do have a significant degree of implicit bias. What's also important to think about is medical treatment uh, is a function not only of the way the doctor treats the patient, but also the way the patient responds to the doctor. That is, they are in fact, uh, the outcomes are intimately tied together and they both have information that each need. So the question we looked at is how do black patients perceive doctors who are more implicitly biased? Now, um, in our studies, Patients don't know anything about the implicit attitudes of the doctors. They don't know anything about what we're studying. 
But what we did was we looked at um, the impressions that black patients had of doctors as a function of the doctor's level of implicit bias. And what we find is after the visit with a doctor, black patients uh, who were with a doctor who was more implicitly biased, who was higher in implicit bias, um, the patients felt less involved, the patients respected, trusted, and liked the doctor less, they, re they recommended the doctor less, they were more likely to come back to the same doctor in the future. And importantly, a couple of things. They remembered less information that the doctors had given them. So they didn't process the information as well in the medical encounter. And ultimately they were less accepting of treatment. And this occurred not only immediately after um, the visit, but even up to one week afterwards. And let me give you an example of what this consequence is, because it seems like the doctor's behaviors, you know, shorter visit, faster speech, that's hard to detect relative to any other kind of interaction, but it has profound consequences. And here's one of the profound consequences. In one of our studies of oncological interactions, cancer-related interactions, what we found is that in, in these very high stakes encounters, very structured encounters, um, oncologists who had a higher level of implicit bias um, tended to be um, lower in patient centeredness and, be, and, be, and to be perceived by patients as lower in patient centeredness. But importantly, <coughs> to an indirect path through patient centeredness, um, the patient perceived a greater difficulty in completing the cancer treatments. And ultimately, the patients had a less confidence in the cancer treatments that were recommended by the physician. We don't have information. Uh, we weren't able to get subsequent information about what the patient chose to do. But in these high stake interactions, questions about um, the effectiveness of the doctor, um, questions about the treatment, lower confidence in the doctor and the treatment will likely lead to decisions that ultimately can have mortal consequences for the patient. So subtle behaviors can have really significant medical consequences. Um, and those subtle behaviors are rooted in physician implicit bias. Um, I'll say a couple of things about this um, before I go into what we can do about it. But I want you to understand that um, there's profound distrust of Black Americans, of the medical community, um, and of the individual physicians. 57% of Black respondents say that discrimination occurs often or very often in the interactions with white physicians. Most white physicians say it doesn't occur because they're operating at an explicit level and they're controlling the behaviors that they can control and they're being non-prejudiced and that's what they monitor and experience. But the majority of black patients experience uh, discrimination and that experience of discrimination has these important consequences on how much you would hear and how much you're willing to pursue treatment with that physician. Another interesting finding that I had uh, I've seen, this is not our, our uh, finding, but black people show lower levels of trust of their physician after the visit. So in a couple of studies, what they did was they had um, patients in the waiting room who were, uh, who were going to meet a doctor for the first time, black and white patients. And they asked them how much uh, they trusted their physician before they even met the physician. Uh, both black and white patients showed a um, 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 high level of trust for the physician before they even met the physician. White patients were a little bit more than black patients. They, they gave the questionnaires to the patients after the visit. And what they found was that white patients uh, trusted their physician highly before the visit and highly after the visit. Black patients trusted the physician less after the visit. So something was happening in the interaction that they detected probably through these nonverbal behaviors that were driven by the physician's implicit bias. And they ended up trusting their physician uh, less actually after meeting the physician than even before. 
So there's an erosion of trust that's occurring as a result of these implicit bias. And this is important because the participation of patients in continued care and trust um, are really important to things like seeking treatment and adherence. So small behaviors have big outcomes. So I wanna talk a little bit about uh, not just the problem, but how we address it. And I'm gonna talk about sort of different kinds of interventions um, and, and discuss their effectiveness. And I'm gonna talk about them at different levels. Uh, some I'm just gonna do quickly, others I'll dive in a little bit more. So you can think about interventions at a personal level, and there are a number of them. One of the uh, common interventions is making uh, white people aware of implicit bias and its effects. Um, and, and that has certain uh, benefits and it can motivate people to become better than they are. But I wanna say what we found in, in medicine is that making um, medical students aware that they might be implicitly biased actually backfired in some ways. Those who became more aware that they were implicitly biased actually turned out to be less likely to wanna to serve um, in, in minority related populations. So they chose a career choice when they felt that they might be uh, biased, they actually wanted to avoid situations where they would encounter black patients. Um, and what it led to was uh, less willingness to serve underserved populations in, in their practice after uh, medical school. So you have to be aware that there is no insight cure and that many of the interventions that make people simply aware of their bias can have some, uh, can backfire in some ways. Probably the most common way is to not only take that increased awareness, but to give people more specific training in anti-bias um, education. And there are a number of ways that occurs. This is a, a billion dollar business um, in the world, in the United States. And um, it's an important uh, thrust of medical education. What I'm gonna do is talk about one study that we did, actually a couple of studies, series of studies that we did uh, where we uh, followed medical students. Um, we took over 3000 white medical students from 49 different uh, schools. Uh, stratified on a number of different dimensions. Um, we assessed uh, a number of things in their first year of medical school as they entered medical school. We reassessed uh, many of those things, including implicit bias in the last year of medical school. And then we also uh, obtained a large sample of those in residency uh, two years after medical school where they're beginning their practice. And we looked at a variety of predictors of implicit bias um, and they were um, diverse, uh, how much diversity education they had. Um, observations or experiences of other people's bi being biased in medical school and how much interracial contact they had in medical school. And our main um, outcome of interest was the implicit bias of these students at the end of medical school. And then again, two years later in residency. Uh, when you look at implicit bias at the end of medical school, uh, a couple of things I want you to notice is despite us being highly powered, uh, when you look at the formal curriculum diversity education, it had no impact, no significant impact on the implicit attitudes of medical students from the, uh, in terms of change of implicit bias from the first year to their fourth year. What did have an effect on the level of implicit bias was how much bias they experienced and observed of other people, other significant people, peers and attending physicians and instructors towards black Americans. Those, they didn't, they didn't experience many incidents of observing bias against black Americans, but those uh, uh, medical students who observed either an attending physician or uh, peer, resident, uh, peer medical students uh, make slurs, jokes, or have other kinds of expressions of bias towards Black Americans, release their implicit bias. And at the end of medical school, they had a higher level of implicit bias than before. However, what did affect and reduce implicit bias uh, from the first year to the fourth year of medical school was how much positive interracial contact they had with other Black students uh, in medical school. 
And so the interracial experience, which was kind of firsthand knowledge, tended to undermine the implicit bias that they had as they entered and actually produced a reduction of implicit bias at the end. If you look at residency, the diversity education they had in medical school still has no effect on them. Um, the, uh, the bias they observed in medical school seemed to be context related. It had no effect, but the interracial contact that they had in medical school still affected, still predicted the implicit bias um, two years later after medical school. Those who had more positive experiences and frequent positive experiences were less implicitly biased after medical school. What I will say is that um, any kind of intervention that people try to sell you to reduce implicit bias through education, through anti-bias education, in all the work that we've done in the recent paper I've done with Tony Greenwald where we reviewed the literature, you can't change people's implicit bias very much because these implicit biases were laid down in life early on, the habits of mind, and it's really difficult to change them in any significant or enduring way um, through any kind of intervention. So I would argue that if you think the goal of anti-bias education is to reduce your implicit bias, um, you're wrong, it can't do it. And anybody who sells you anti-bias training to reduce uh, implicit bias um, is selling snake oil. It, it, the literature just, the evidence just doesn't support it. But what training can do is give you the tools to help prevent you from expressing discrimination as a function of your implicit bias. So what training can do is emphasize self-care. Uh, some work we did in 2009 showed that um, uh, providers who were experiencing high levels of burnout would tend to express uh, high levels of implicit bias and act on those higher levels of implicit bias in their practice. So what you can do is try to limit the fatigue, limit the cognitive demand, limit the burnout um, to um, uh, that, that people are experiencing. And the reason is this, implicit bias is automatically activated. We often spend much of our time suppressing, controlling, overcoming, compensating for our implicit biases, but those take uh, um, a lot of cognitive, explicit cognitive effort. If our cognitive resources are depleted, then we don't have those defenses anymore and the implicit biases uh, run rampant, not only in terms of it being expressed, but being expressed in terms of discrimination. The other thing uh, that we recommend is increasing mindfulness. And it can be done through loving kindness meditation, which is what we did. But to give people tools to, to reduce the fatigue, to, to uh, uh, recharge their defenses. And so creating things that produce uh, uh, self-care where, where uh, providers can pause, reflect, um, uh, revitalize their defenses is the best way of preventing implicit bias from turning into subtle forms of discrimination. I'll just say briefly two other things that, that we recommend. I got to go back there. Uh, two other things that we recommend. One are what I would call corrective strategies. So one of the things we find is that when you individuate people, and the social psychological literature has a robust literature on this, when you think about people as individuals rather than group members, um, then you don't activate the stereotypes of the group. So when I begin to think about somebody in a very individuated way, as a personal way, it takes more effort to do that, but then it doesn't come with the baggage of social categorization and the stereotypes that come with that social categorization. So um, what we've been recommending physicians do is work very early on, on on trying to understand their patient as an individual. This goes against a lot of medical culture because when you hear case histories, what you would traditionally hear is the person is a black male of age 52. Well, you know, that's because medicine is rooted, a lot of medicine is rooted in understanding base rates. 
And so when you talk about base rates, you talk about categories. But when you talk about categories, the first thing that get, gets activated is all the things associated with that category, which is things that can uh, produce differential treatment of black relative to white patients. Uh, we argue that race is okay to mention if it's relevant, but if it's not relevant, you always start by individuating the person and focusing on the, pa uh, the, the patient as a unique case because of all the complex factors that go into uh, medical diagnosis and medical treatment. The other thing I'll just say briefly here is uh, uh, good training also talks about reparative strat strategies. And what I've tried to argue is even if you're the most well-meaning person in, uh, in the world, we're still susceptible to the effects of implicit bias. And if most of us are implicitly biased, that means under certain circumstances, we are going to behave and express ourselves in a way that's offensive to people of color. So what we also have to learn is when we offend somebody, what do we do to repair that relationship? because it's important, trust and understanding is important. I can tell you before I started doing this research, uh, years ago um, when I would uh, interact with a black person who would say something like, what you did just offended me, I got very defensive. I would, I, I would probe my mind and say, am I biased? And I would say to myself, no, I'm not biased. And I would say, is there anything I did that I, I can monitor? that might have offended this person. And I would say no, because every time I can monitor and control something, it goes along with my egalitarian images. But it doesn't mean that I'm not unconsciously biased and expressing that in some way. And when I would, what I would typically do in those situations, which most of you will recognize as being a terrible idea, is I would say something like, no, I didn't. Or even worse, no, you don't understand. Here, and try to justify why uh, what I was doing and why they were wrong. What I've learned is that invalidates the experience of the black person. And what the black person experienced is probably real. It was just outside of my consciousness, outside of my awareness. So uh, a, the simple thing that we try to do is get people in those situations to begin by saying, not being defensive, but to say instead, I'm sorry for offending you, because if I offend you consciously or unconsciously, directly or indirectly, I am truly sorry. And that allows us to make this a growth opportunity where I can now come to understand and ask and meet the other person where they are about what I did wrong and what I can do better. The other thing I'll, I'll just mention briefly is trying to create collaborative um, strategies where um, it's important that uh, when you observe somebody engaging in a biased fashion, whether intentional or not, that we as observers intervene. Because if we don't intervene, then we become perceived as um, perpetuators of bias rather than somebody who is actually helping to intervene to reduce bias. So good, good interventions um, also have um, bystander intervention kinds of components to them. I want to talk about just a few structural things and go into one more study, and then we'll have time for questions. Uh, one of the key takeaways that I would say, as a social psychologist, we focus on the individual, and the individual's um, intentions become really important to us. But what I want to argue is an understanding of how implicit uh, bias operates says that we can't trust people's intentions. Intentions may be very good. Intentions may lead to positive behaviors 95% of the time. But um, um, uh, equality is an absolute. If I treat you equally 95% of the time, but I treat you unequally, I discriminate 5% of the time, I am treating you unequally. So it's important to understand that we can't trust people's intentions. We have to come up with structural interventions. And, and this is where public health has been so informative to me. I'll just mention three of these. Uh, I won't go into detail, but one is um, it's important to assess outcomes at an organizational level. 
Uh, one of the things that in the example I gave you about uh, the way subtle prejudice operates is we engage in subtle bias only when we can justify it or rationalize it on the basis of some factor other than race. And therefore we tend to have blinders on it because we don't see what we did as unfair. We don't see the outcome as being unfair because we can justify it on the basis of some reason other than race. But what's important is to be able to take data at an aggregate level and ask yourself within an organization, are the treatments that black people receive on average equivalent to the treatments that white people receive? Um, it's important to not only look at what's intended and what's done, but how is it um, experienced by patients? Are there disparities in the patient reports of patients who are black compared to patients who are white? Because that helps you detect where there's leakages and where there are leakages. If you don't measure something, you're not gonna change it. And we measure the things that are important to us and disparities in healthcare should be important to us. A second thing, which is not mine, but the idea is that you have to think about treating not only the individual, but healthcare institutions have to talk about treating communities. Because in fact, many of the reasons for disparities in health and healthcare uh, relate to poverty, low SES, relate to residential segregation and toxic environments. So the argument we make is that healthcare organizations not only have to think about preventive care for the individual, but kinds of investments in the community that produce preventive outcomes where people live in better environments, have access to better food. And so um, healthcare organizations can actually improve the welfare of people indirectly by improving the welfare of the um, uh, communities in which they serve. And finally, let me just say in terms of structural is medical education. I just want to point out that um, just a couple of factoids for you is that medical education, which has traditionally been about weeding out, has disadvantaged Black Americans. Black Americans are underrepresented uh, in um, all the healthcare professions and underrepresented still in medical school vastly. Uh, it's important if you want equality in healthcare to have equal representation or proportional representation in healthcare. A couple of things to understand is that about 50% of uh, all the doctors in America, to, uh, Black doctors in America today, went to historically Black colleges and universities. That colleges like Harvard, uh, Johns Hopkins, Yale, that produce uh, many, uh, many doctors, um, typically produce a low proportion of Black doctors. Um, um, in fact, Xavier uh, University in New Orleans, a historically black uh, university, uh, produces more doctors in, in a given year than Johns Hopkins, Yale, and uh, Harvard combined. So uh, more, more students going to medical school. So I think that there are structural things to do within the curriculum. I'm gonna talk about one last sort of idea of intervention. Um, again, what I want to do is bridge public health and, and social psychology and then end and ask for questions. Um, one of the recommendations that has come up is the idea, and it's become very popular in medical education, is to have patient-centered care, to train physicians to be respectful and responsive to, um, to patients um, as a way of improving the quality of care. That has many of the benefits of um, individuation, and it has many of the benefits of uh, focusing on the patient and the particular needs of a patient that may be caused by racism outside the medical um, community. Um, but it's hard to sustain that when your um, uh, cognitive demand is high. What we've tried to argue is that you can think about structural interventions that dovetail with patient-centered care. And that's what I would call partnership building. Um, our uh, argument is if you want to improve the quality of medical care, what you want to do is improve the relationship between the physician and the patient. That is, it's not about fixing the physician, it's not about fixing the patient in isolation, it's about fixing their relationship and making it as productive as possible. 
And one of the arguments we make is based on the premise that doctors have information that um, patients need, but patients have information that doctors need. And so the idea is to get people to think of the partnership between a doctor and a patient as a team and create what we call a common in-group identity. As I mentioned at the beginning, when we socially categorize people as a member of our own group, we trust them more, we're more uh, supportive of them, we're more likely to extend ourselves for them, we're more sensitive to their needs. And even though race is a default category in America, people will change their uh, primary level of categorization based on context. And in a, a medical context, if we can get patients and doctors to think of themselves as members of the same team, you're gonna get the benefits of in-group categorization from both the doctor and the patient and create a, a better relationship. So here's the study I wanna talk about. What we did was in a, a medical clinic in Detroit, um, what we did was we tried to create in, in two wings of a clinic, the sense that the doctor and the patient were members of the same team. We had um, information that was read by the patients as they entered the clinic. We had posters around that emphasized that uh, in this clinic, doctors and patients were members of the same team with common goals, shared responsibility and joint decision-making. That they were partners working to solve problems collectively and collaboratively. And what we did was if that wasn't enough, uh, we gave doctors uh, and patients color-coded buttons. Uh, so you were in on the red team or the yellow team, color-coded pens. We even painted the walls of the clinic uh, according to these team memberships. And so uh, both the doctor and the patient would read the, this information that they were on the same team and, and that, that was emphasized in the interactions. Uh, in the control condition in two other wings of the clinic, it was standard of care. Um, what we did was, I'm just gonna talk about one of the measures is in the control condition was the standard of care. We measured how much trust the patient had for the doctor immediately, how much patient uh, trust they had uh, four weeks later, and how much trust they had 16 weeks later. The patients were all black in the study and the physicians were uh, white and, and other non-black physicians. What we found is black patients generally trusted their physician immediately after the visit. Uh, although not completely. Four weeks later, that trust eroded, and 16 weeks later, it further eroded. But in the same team condition, where they started as a foundation of their relationship, that they were members of the same team, which uh, didn't lead them to ignore race, but made race secondary, what we found is that there was a high level of trust um, right after the, the encounter, Four weeks later, it was sustained, and 16 weeks later, the patients had a high level of trust for their physician. And what's important here is that the level of trust that patients had of their physician after four weeks was the best predictor, a significant predictor of how adherent the patient was four weeks later, uh, uh, 16 weeks later. And so it had tangible medical outcomes if you start with the right foundation. So let me just end here. Um, what I wanna say is uh, the take home message is that there are racial disparities in health and some of them are caused by racial disparities in healthcare. If you take the approach that there's a normality of bias, that doesn't mean it's good, but it means we're all susceptible to it. Even well-intentioned and well-educated people are susceptible to being biased. And this produces results in some treatment recommendations but a lot on the quality of healthcare uh, and interactions. But just because we're implicitly biased doesn't mean we're destined to be discriminatory. It means it's not inevitable, but we need multi-level interventions. So let me just acknowledge uh, many people for this and the funding institutions. Um, and let me just thank you and open it up for questions. So what I'm gonna do is get off here. And Kathy, you still there? Yes, I am. Hi, Jerry. Okay. I always, <laughs> when I, I always have this fear of Zoom that I'm going to wake up and everybody's gone. <laughs>
<laughs> so let me, can you stop sharing your screen a second, Jack, and I'll see if I can. Yeah, well, let me find who you are. Hang on here. Zoom, 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 zoom. Okay, hang on here. Maybe I can do that. I lost my stop sharing. Hang on. You were here uh, somewhere. Yeah, let me try it another way. Yeah. Um, where are you? Let me just do it this I way. I got you. I got you it. You guys can control your own screen. There we go. <laughs> I got it. Yeah, there you are. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you, Jack. First of all, very comprehensive on implicit bias and ideas for intervention. And question there from David first. First, okay, okay, all right. So, um, thanks, Andrea. Um, so, Jack, why don't you um, start first with the question you started to look at in the beginning in the chat um, from Dr. Rosner? Do you see that um, when yeah. you said you'd address that later? Yeah, I mean, I, I try to come back to that at the end in the sense that. Um, okay, so, sorry. Um, Jack, uh, the, the apparently the question is not real clear in the room. So let me. Do you want oh, yeah. to, David? Yeah. Do you want to just ask it? Uh, sure. It's uh, you know. It's, thank you very much, first of all, and I really appreciate the talk. I'm just wondering whether or not uh, these categories of black and white and who's in a group and who's not in a group are so socially constructed historically, <laughs> who is and who is not part of your group, that I'm wondering whether addressing it through an individual effort really can get at the, I hate to use these terms, the root causes of how we, how racism operates. And that, uh, you know, I, as I said, you know, Jews and Italians were once not part of the group, now they are. So I ask mm -hmm. what are the structural interests that create the group? Who benefits and who bears the burden are pretty fundamental. Um, structurally and historically. So I wonder if the psychological paradigm of trying to address it through a program focused on patient and doctor behavior is in some sense unconsciously adopting a paradigm that excuses the social system that produces racism. I, I, it's, not, it's not a critique of your work, but it's a critique yeah. of how we think about the issue. And I'm wondering whether you just had any thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm going to say um, I agree with your critique. Um, I'm going to say that at the individual level, um, if we can do things to alleviate uh, uh, biases and, and unfair treatment, that's doing a social good, but it's unsustainable. Um, and so it's a, you can think of it like a Band-Aid. Uh, in some ways, it's good. It's going to help in the healing, but um, that I think the ultimate solution is to move to much more structural things. So, you know, race is a social construction. Uh, race is, um, uh, you know, uh, race in medicine has been around a long time, uh, and it comes from slavery, but it predates slavery in terms of thinking about different races as being fundamentally different uh, genetically and biologically. Um, so the roots run way deep. And um, so I think the ultimate strategy, if I had my, my way around it would be, um, one is to make people aware of bias uh, so that they can correct for it. Because if we can correct for it, even in the short term, we're saving lives. Um, second of all, I think it's important um, to get this out in the open uh, so that black patients can become empowered in interactions and understand uh, it's not them, it's the nature of it. Um, I think it's important to bring this up as a social construction um, because I think medicine has grudgingly uh, resisted that in a sense that so much of it is based on, there, there are a lot of, um, algorithms that throw race into the algorithm in a way that's totally unjustified. You've got to change the algorithms. Um, and to do that, you have to think about people, uh, they have to think about race as a social construction rather than a biological fact. Um, but ultimately, we're going to need major structural changes to sustain, to make a big difference. So that's a long way of saying, 
Um, on the one hand, I think I agree with you um, in terms of the long the long term. In the short term, I think that um, uh, I still think it's valuable to change individuals, um, but to sustain it, we need to change systems. I was not arguing that it's not valuable. I was just saying. <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> ultimately, ultimately, we got a bigger problem in this culture. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think yeah, I think we're alive. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. I'm going to let uh, Ron wants to, what person in the room. I'm going to bring the microphone. Ron Mayer. Hi. Uh, the question I have it may seem very small compared to the big picture you've painted, but I think there is. It, it, there seems to be a paradox in what you've said. Sometime in your talk, you said when you uh, someone is presenting a case. And they say, this is a case of a black American who is 39 years old, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you said, it's problematical to introduce the case by mentioning the race, because then you put the person in a group rather than an individual. But that person brings to the, the medical encounter a history of racism and oppression. So how can you not identify the patient as a black patient while this, you're suggesting that that's a mistaken way of beginning, and it seems to me there's a paradox in what you suggested. Yeah, and and I thank you. I mean, I appreciate it. I, I use the word beginning on purpose, and we're we're relevant on purpose. Um, that is, if a person comes in with a broken leg, um, to say it's a black male with a broken leg. Um, may divert effective treatment rather than help treatment because it, that seems to be not a primary factor in the person's uh, um, situation. Now, one might argue that knowing that the, the patient is black um, might allow you to anticipate um, um, different levels of trust in the treatment or all sorts of things. And so that's why I use the word beginning. Where you put it makes a difference. Um, so I, I, you know, even in the team situation, we didn't ask doctors to ignore the person's race. That colorblindness is is devastating, because you can't you can't make the adjustments to the experiences that people have, because other people categorize them based uh, based on race. So I, I I'll just say, you know, I think the idea was uh, that I tried to I wanted to convey was that race should be put in perspective where it's relevant, but not always be the initial lead because of tradition. Uh, thank you, Jack. Um, we have just a couple minutes left and I was wondering if I'm looking at the two other comments in the chat. Uh, one is from, no, I lost it, but it's about multicultural education from Ruby about how this supports the importance of multicultural um, education programs. And then a second comment by Gina Wingood about that racism actually is uh, throughout the healthcare um, setting situation um, and potentially mm -hmm. intervening with um, people, not just that in the patient provider interaction from making your appointments and so on. <laughs> so I don't know if there's a, if you wanna comment, you wanna think about that. And I see Merlin also has his hand raised. So yeah, let, let me go quickly yeah. uh, to both of those and then I can, so the other person can get it in. Yes, I think, you know, uh, actually I'm a big proponent of multicultural experiences um, early on in life because, uh, uh, race is an aspect of people that's important, but uh, implicit bias gets laid down early in life. And I think one of the best predictors of people's implicit bias, uh, lower levels of implicit bias, is the amount of positive interracial experience that, that they've had early in life. And so I think, um, yes, this is, speaks highly of, of multicultural education. And, and for the second question, yes, in fact, in the work that we do in diversity science, what we argue is by the time the patient even gets to see the doctor gets in the room, they've run, they often have run the gauntlet of racism, um, implicit as well as explicit. And so um, again, you have to think about it. And, and this was going back to the previous question, the experience of the patient. And um, you know, the response I always have is why should, Black Americans trust. Uh, 
um, uh, the medical system. I can give you a hundred reasons why they shouldn't. Um, so you have to think about everything from, you know, um, right from the community support to the person where they make the, 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 the um, uh, um, set up the, the meeting to the receptionist, to the nurse, to the, all the way through. So it's just, so yes and yes. Now, the other question. Thank you, Jack. Merlin, do you want to, um, you want to just say what you were wondering or you have a comment or question for the last option? There you are. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, I learned a lot. Um, I had a question about something that you said at the very start of the of the presentation about um, the the groups that some of this research is done about and that you were going to stick to kind of a black white binary conception but you know as we know especially in cities like new york and los angeles um, and others uh, the the healthcare space and just the general demography of the country has just changed so rapidly and um, it's not just black and white people interacting in the healthcare space. The healthcare workforce is mostly an immigrant workforce, um, including many black immigrants. Um, and so I'm just wondering how you know, the, the, the physician workforce is like 20% Asian. So I'm, I'm wondering if um, how, how the framework um, that this research uh, you've done um, how, how it needs to be adjusted or if it needs to be adjusted for this new racial demography. Um, and I'm just speaking somewhat personally as a, someone from Los Angeles. Um, mm -hmm. you know, the racial groups that are in Los Angeles, I think, think of themselves in, in very triangular terms. Um, so they, they, they think of themselves with, with respect to not just another group in a binary, but all the other groups in, in the kaleidoscope that is Los Angeles. And so my guess is that that might introduce um, some complexity to this, but I don't know, maybe it's it's all subsumable to this too. And I, I imagine you've had some thoughts on this, so. Um, yeah. yeah. No, no, really good. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna say to you, yes, you're right. I mean, uh, um, and part of this is that, um, when you focus on black white relationships, not only is it an oversimplification, you know, I will argue that most uh, a lot of Americans think in terms of black and white, which is uh, 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 so it operates, it still has a strong influence. Um, but the model doesn't transfer to other groups as well. And other groups come in with a lot of, um, and, and diversity is diverse um, and intersectional and many other things. So this is an inadequate model for all sorts of relationships. I'll give you one, one quick example too. There's some work that suggests that Latinx patients have very different expectations um, and, and preferences than black patients. So even though uh, Latinx patients probably are the second highest group um, comp uh, compared to blacks in relation to whites showing healthcare disparities. Uh, actually uh, indigenous populations show very high as well. But um, there was some work that at least some Latinx populations, which are also very diverse, um, don't respond as well to patient-centered care, that they are more comfortable with a hierarchical relationship with their physician than Black patients. Black patients respond much better to patient-centered care than do Latinx. Um, and there's also some work that the implicit bias that physicians have towards um, Latinx patients um, don't have as, as robust an impact on the perceptions of Latinx patients as uh, implicit bias towards Blacks has towards Black patients. So, um, so the answer is yes. I think that there are some take home messages that will transfer, but I think that uh, recognizing the complexity and the diversity within diversity is essential. Well, uh, let me just thank you again, Jack, for a really um, thoughtful and comprehensive and methodological presentation. I think and I think that we should probably wrap. I think there's a class in here shortly. Many classes okay. are at one. <laughs> um, but, um, and thanks to everyone for joining the Zoom and those in the room today. And um, uh, we do have some snacks down the hall. Sorry, you guys on the Zoom can't, can't uh, join us. <laughs> So, so, Kathy, let me just say, I want to just end by thanking you all for your patience and your questions and your attentiveness. Um, 
Um, I did have on my slides there a uh, couple of email addresses. And if there's, if there's things that you want to talk about more, um, I'm available uh, to do that. If there's information more that you want, I'm available. Um, so I really uh, appreciate your patience. And I know there's a class in there and it's lunchtime. So uh, I'll, let, I'll let you go. But I, I did want to invite you and, and tell you that this is the beginning of a relationship, if you want, uh, not the end. Thank you, Jack. That's very meaningful and unexpected of you. So <laughs> since you're known for such collaboration. So thank you very much. It's a, I'm so glad we finally made this happen. So thanks, everyone. OK, thank you. Bye. Uh, in the innovation lab. <laughs> Let's become our, become our snack place.
that's why I say it's going to be bigger. I didn't want the headphone here. I didn't see any great. So, yeah. I'll have a headphone. Okay. It was a very good presentation, but you know what I thought that I am surprised no one brought up? I think it, it, it's the case for very early childhood education on this topic. She kept saying it's laid down very early and you can't do anything later. I mean, it's a long-term solution, yeah, yeah. But, but of course, with all the Republican issues now about parental Right, they never count parents. I don't want my kids being taught like well, well, yeah, they're bad to black, black people. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, they should feel bad about themselves. Right, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, no, yeah. yeah, these are the conversations that you need to have very, the right. same way that you that racism is developed. But you couldn't get it in the schools, I'm saying, because parents no. would no. never, uh, Republican parents would no. never do it. No. <laughs> Just like they don't want race, say the history of Absolutely. racism taught. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. And then it was interesting what he said at the end, right? About the like, that land next population of the population. Yeah. Yeah. It's like that that patient center. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it was good. He was a nice clear speaker and the slides are clear yeah. and everything, you know? Yeah. It was a good car. Yeah. I mean, but we've been talking about discrimination in the, yeah. in the healthcare system. So this is yeah. This is it. Uh-huh. And you know, I, I think we need to look at the data around. The, the Washington Heights zip code. As well. Right. But you know what I was wondering? If you had doctors who you assessed to their implicit bias, and let's say you had 10 that what, didn't have very low implicit bias if that exists, and 10 that had high, and then you assign patients randomly to them, would the patients who went to the low implicit still feel? In other words, did they come right. with the expectation yeah, they're sort of that, there's, yeah, that yeah. they're not going to be yeah. treated well or right? Yeah. Exactly. That would be interesting to see, I think, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Right, because we, I mean, patients have their own. Yep, yeah, people right. see what they expect to see yeah, very yeah. often, exactly. everyone, yeah. you know. So, yeah, yeah, are they expecting that they're not going to be treated the same way, or they or they assume they're being treated differently than a white person would be, so yeah. they come out less satisfied, yeah. even if that person really doesn't have implicit bias, right. and that's for them. Yeah. I mean, and even even in our in other studies and in our study, like people are like it doesn't matter if they're Latino. Like, what matters is that their cultural preferences, like, yeah. and that's where the implicit bias comes in, right? Right. If right. the assumption is if you're culturally competent, then you don't have that. That right. implicit bias is lower, right? Because right. you have you have made an effort to under, understand the culture, right? Right. Um, right. And you may have had that exposure, that cultural like social interaction. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, so at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what the race of the provider is, is really yeah, yeah. It's, it's how it's, yeah, how competent they are. Um, are they sensitive? Are they competent? Right. right. Um, yeah, I this is it's I'm, we're trying to sort of undo something that is is been in place. Yeah, for so long. Yeah. Right? Yeah. As as, as it's we, unconscious. We do yeah. Very mm -hmm. And especially when they don't perceive themselves as biased. So we come by like gender, Carolyn, right. right? Like men could do this, and women can do right. this. Exactly. Categorized by age, older people can do this, or right. categorized for everything. It's yeah. just so it's it's really hard. Yeah. No, it is. It definitely is. Yeah. Yeah. But the perception of the person, yeah. Anyway, more to talk. <laughs> but it's so interesting. I love this. I yeah, love no, it was a very good talk. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Very Public health, public theology, and social psychology. <laughs> 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 <laughs>